From the East Coast to the West Coast, we are everywhere true crime is. We are asking for the public's help. We are searching in the woods. We are doing what it takes here on the Bullhorn Betty channels to find answers to the most alarming cases we have been watching on the news. I can tell you personally that I have traveled this entire country seeking these answers and bringing that content right here to you here on the Bullhorn Betty channels and Bullhorn Betty crime stories. We are happy with the work that we've done. We brought many answers to the public and we have defied mainstream media in our pursuit of the truth in these cases. We will continue to work we will continue to fight for these victims and we will continue to tell their stories here on my channels. Welcome to the Bullhorn Betty brand of channels and the coffee club. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your support. And more importantly, thank you for allowing me to bring these victims stories to each and every one of you advocating for each of these victims. God bless you. God bless America. And more importantly, God bless our victims. Why, good morning, my beautiful people. Happy Friday, TGIF. It is Friday, right? I'm, I'm half asleep. <laughs> I've been traveling. I've been traveling. TGIF to all my beautiful viewers. As you guys know, we do a morning update with our uh, case updates and... I just go over these cases, explain where we are at the moment. Um, we're going to be talking off the, the cuff about uh, Jillian Kelly, which is the preacher's wife, as well as Veronica Butler. Uh, her her in-laws are the ones that caused this entire issue. <laughs> Thank you, Grand Rising. I got to tell you, that trip kind of took it out of me. I, I was glued to my bed. I was I was an exhausted little girl. I didn't sleep much. I didn't sleep much. It was a lot of running around a lot of driving, and it was just, you know, obviously three days. I flew in um, one day, went to court the next day, and flew out the next day. So it was just a whirlwind, um, you know, over the last few days. But I, I did get rust yesterday, so we're ready to rock it out with our coffee beans out today. And I'm looking at this case, and I, I one of the biggest questions that I had in this case is when we first learned about it, you know, the father um, or the, the grandmother – we had learned fairly early on that might be a problem, that she has had these tendencies. We have already heard that she was talking about it to a few people, what have you. Um, in the affidavit, there was a person um, named in the affidavit. And the person named in the affidavit, there was two additional people. There was a prop, the Beasley property where they actually located, from my understanding, these actual remains were on the Beasley property. I don't know how that works in conjunction with um, what we're looking at now. You know, I don't know who Beasley is. I don't know what his involvement is, or he was just, you know, that might have been a property that was just being rented and was owned uh, by Beasley. But another name had come up in the investigation, and that name is Paul Grice. Do you guys recognize that name? It was in the affidavit. I made this too big. But uh, somebody posted uh, yesterday that uh, Paul Grice was actually arrested, and there's a picture of Paul Grice right there. And they said that he was arrested. And uh, right here, I'm hearing that suspect re was released due to lack of evidence. Paul Grice is out and about, it seems. So it sounds like he has not been arrested. Um, it sounds like, according to a lot of people, this man was physically there at location. I don't know why nobody's seen him or why they have a lack of evidence. I'm sure it will be developing. His name's been brought up enough times that I believe that he will eventually be arrested for whatever his um, culpability is in that. Right now, he's denying. They're saying they don't really have evidence. They still haven't processed the vehicles, I, I don't believe fully. You know, is there evidence, you know, forensically, forensic evidence um, attaching him to the vehicle because remember, according to what we heard, he was on scene. He was there um, blocking the roadway, forcing Veronica and Jillian to take a different path, which is probably that dirt road. 
and they probably went up a thousand feet to wherever whoever was in the middle of the road stopping them so i don't know you know it's just this i i can't even imagine what these ladies went through i cannot imagine the fear in their eyes their fear in their body what i i just i i this is the stuff that makes me upset that gets me sick to my stomach when I start thinking about these cases and what makes me work so hard for them is because I feel, you know, and it's like you almost can envision it. When you read that affidavit, you almost envision somebody trying to run away and being drunk. I mean, it's just awful. It's just awful. And um, the excuse that the family is using, this is all I'm going to address with this and we'll we'll move on to some information about um, Riley Strain as well as uh, Sebastian Rogers. This this group is trying to justify their actions by saying that, you know, because we read that affidavit, they felt that her brother would hurt the children, okay? I want you guys to let that sink in. They, in their mind, think her brother. Now, I don't know anything about her brother. You know, if you guys have anything on her brother, send it to me. I don't know if he's he's lawfully an RSO, if this was just an allegation raised or if he really did it. I don't know. I don't know who her brother is. I don't know that aspect. All I know is related to the case that we're covering. There is no possibility that her brother was involved, right? There are some allegations that came up that her brother may have been an SO, okay? A doing SA type of engagements with, you know, underage. That's basically what's being alleged here. Well, if that's the case from this group, can you tell me or explain to me why they stalked her in February, wanted her to come out of her house in February, why it's her and her that are now having to be put in a box and buried? You know, why? Why a woman here and a woman here, two people that from the best of my knowledge have never been accused of those type of crimes, never, 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 never. So if this group was so concerned about RSOs or SOs, people that prey on the youth, okay, then why did they set it up to go after her brother? Uh, from the best of my knowledge, I haven't heard anybody even in this family breathe that they believe these ladies do anything like that or engage in those kinds of disgusting things with children. They're accusing her brother. I didn't hear one time in that affidavit how they were trying to find her brother or trying to locate her brother or trying to make sure he could never hurt a child again. Never heard that so far. So if her defense attorney's planning on using that, well, I hope they don't. Somebody's asking about um, Sebastian Rogers. Yes, we are going to give an update on Sebastian Rogers here in just a second. But before we dovetail in there, here's a case we don't cover on here. Chronicles of Olivia covered this case about Grant Solomon. Do you guys remember um, Grant Solomon's case? This is a, a uh, adult boy that was heading to uh, some type of camp. Was it a basketball or baseball or something like that? I'll read it here. It's in this little thing behind me. And his truck, apparently, according to his dad, now, mind you, his entire family fears his father. Um, Olivia talked to Grant's mom and sister. The sister will have absolutely nothing to do with the father. They believe the father intentionally did this. That is the story. Law enforcement in Gallatin, Tennessee. Sounds familiar, right? That's, to be honest with you, my, one of my mods in my chat actually just happened to throw this in one of our... Um, our, our uh, rumor mills and said, I didn't even realize Grant Solomon was in Gallatin, Tennessee, right next to where Sebastian's, you know, uh, Chris Proudfoot's parents live in Gallatin. You know, this is all happening. You know, these police officers, I told you, I complain about police officers in Tennessee all day long because they don't do anything. They have to have the case in a bow for them to get off their butt and do something. This is another example where things don't make sense and nobody gave a damn to dig a little deeper. We have no officers with any curiosity whatsoever in the state of Tennessee, apparently, because here we go again. This is a case that happened in 2020. Uh, again, the only reason why I'm looking at this case is the close proximity to Sebastian Rogers case. And I actually stopped and read this, this uh, post right here from Lauren Conlon. 
And when I read it, I have to, my head was nodding the entire time. Like, okay, I get it. So this kid's truck, according to the father, the father was checking a work email and then all of a sudden he sees this truck. He doesn't hear a son screaming. You know, I can't imagine a truck rolling over me. I'm screaming like a freaking crazy woman. Um, but I didn't hear anything in the statement saying about his screaming or anything like that. But what his father said is the truck was rolling back and drug his boy 60 feet into rocks. Okay, first of all, I've been on motorcycles before. Secondly, I have personally been a curious child that's got on bikes, went running, and everything else. And to the best of my knowledge, not one time, even changing a tire on my car, when I am bare skin to pavement, my skin is scraped up, whether it's bleeding or not, even just kneeling down on cement, there is clear impressions on my body that I was changing a tire, I was kneeling down on asphalt, I was, and good Lord, let me trip or fall, let alone be dragged. I'm going to have a little bit of road rash. There's no way to avoid that. There is absolutely no way to avoid that. But apparently with this boy here, with this boy here, and I mind you, there's no cameras. So this whole event was not recorded in 2020 at a place that teaches kids, again, I don't know how to make this make sense to people in Tennessee, you know? So nobody saw what happened. He's literally 60 feet away from his son on the phone calling police as his son is dying down below. He is literally on the phone telling law enforcement officers that there's three strangers trying to get his son safe while he's still on the phone 60 feet away from his son watching his son literally die. This does not make sense to the normal person because any parent that sees something like that, they're screaming as they're running toward their child. The one last thing that really burns my grits when it comes to the Grant Solomon case is that he has a lone fracture on the back of his head. And those are pretty much the extent of the injuries that he sustained, his life-threatening injuries. Where's the road rash? That's what I want to know. Where's the road rash? 60 feet being drugged by a hot car that just got turned off. Think about that. I don't know if you've ever touched the underneath of a car, but you will blister your butt. Blister your butt. So this hot car on hot asphalt drug him 60 feet. No abrasions consistent with a drag. I'm curious if there was drag patterns of his body on the cement. They probably didn't even look. And his lone injury is blunt force trauma to the back of the head. Hmm. No drags. No abrasions. No broken skin from being drugged 60 feet. I don't know about you, but I think it's a, it's a little odd. Oh, forgot to tell you, the car was still in park. Father rushed the, um, told the people that he wanted to, um, no autopsy and cremation immediately, immediately. So this is all the mom had right now and has had to try to prove that her son but see, this, I think this car might have a box. She needs to get a forensic expert and pull the box because it'll tell what, what um, position this car was in at the time that it got there. And if it was rolled there, was it, in, was it put in neutral or was it driven backwards? I don't know. I don't know. But something just doesn't make sense. Something just doesn't make sense. There's Grant Solomon. Looked like a young, bright, inspiring, good-looking man just wanting to live life, there's his injuries. Hardly something I would see from a person drug 60 feet. Sorry. Like I would expect the backside, I would expect drag marks all here, where whatever was put, like even on his back, if he was drug, if he was drug backwards, all this should be road rash. Elbows should be shaped up, scratched up and everything else. Everything. And we got a, we got a fracture. That's it. That's it. And a bruise. And this was where some bruising is. And this is where a bruise is. And that is, in, in, you know, consistent with slide, you know, sliding into base. 
He's a baseball player, so sliding into base. I think he was going to baseball camp. I think he was going to baseball camp. So these things are right, right here are what's, you know, causing me some issues. I would have expected to have a lot of road rash. 60 feet, you know, sorry, the skin does not do good with, with um, asphalt. If anybody has a child or grandchild that's learning to ride a bike for the first time, you're a prime example for that. What do you do to try to help keep your child from getting from inter, being introduced to that pavement, right? We put elbow guards on. In my day, we weren't that fortunate, right? We were we were we had to be warriors. Like we had it we had to go and get those scratch, scratches and bumps and bruises. We had to bust the skin to learn to ride a bike. This day and age, the kids got it good. They got helmets, they got knee braces, they got uh, knee pads, they got shin pads, they got everything. You, 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 I'm surprised they haven't made a bubble for the kids to learn how to ride bikes yet. It's coming. It's coming to a store near you. Don't worry about it. And anybody that comes up with the idea, you owe you know, Bullhorn Betty 10% of uh, royalty fees just for the idea. You're welcome. <laughs> I need to stop. But you know what I'm saying? So anybody that knows cement and knows skin knows that that in and of itself seems like pretty... It seems like a miracle that he doesn't have any indications of this drag, right? So that really is all I have right now on him. We don't really cover him. This is the first time I let you guys know. Uh, Madeline Soto, nothing has gone on in here. We've already talked about her case. Her case um, has not, nobody's been charged with it. The only charge that Stefan is, is right now facing is the photography and videos. He had 400 images of the deceased girl on his phone in, in very disturbing uh, positions and acts. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, we're thankful that he's behind bars. This is truly a predator, in my opinion. Um, I believe that, you know, now that I'm understanding the case a little better, I do believe Jen Soto does have some culpability, and I don't see how where she's not going to have to face those charges. I don't know whether she's going to go to jail for those or if she's going to be put on probation. But there are some indicators, especially with Stefan, his guns, his everything else in the house, the way he was acting, him threatening to unalive himself inside the home, and Jennifer Soto doing nothing to protect her child from that kind of chaos and stuff. Now, was he living in the house? Was he not living in the house? Did she lie about that? And if she lied about whether he was living in the house or not living in the house, the question would be why? Um, it seemed like she was protecting him an awful lot, either because she didn't believe he did it, I really think is why she did it. I don't think it was because of culpability. But we do have to start looking at this because at the end of the day, this should never have happened. Jennifer had a duty to her daughter. And at the end of the day, as hard as it is for me to say it, she failed at that and her daughter's dead because of it. Um, you know, as hard, hard as that is, I, I'm a rooter of Jennifer Soto. I really don't believe she knew what this man was doing to her daughter. You'll need to convince me more. But I have come off the fence where I do believe she is culpable in something when it comes to her daughter. And um, I do anticipate that she is going to eventually be charged in the situation. And then this is her father right here. Uh, his name's Tyler Wallace. And what gave me an indicator of that is that Jennifer Soto gave her father all of her ashes. And I thought, you know, for a mom to part with her daughter after these circumstances and then give away the ashes, I think she anticipates going to jail personally. I really do. It might have been a situation where dad said, you had her, this is the condition, I'm taking her home with me. It could be that. It could be that. I mean, I, I think that that would be kind of my realm. Honestly, I think if it was if it was my child, I would have I, I would have I would be unglued first and foremost. But I think that that would be my comments. This is you know, she was in your care. This is how she this is what she where she is right now. No, you're done with taking care of our daughter. It's time for me to have her. You did this to her. I mean, as a parent, if something like this had happened, that would be my, in, in this situation, was that would be my, like, give me my damn daughter. Like, so I don't know if that's the situation between her and Tyler. Tyler just seems like a really good, um, you know, earthly dude. You know, he doesn't seem, I mean, he seemed very upset, very emotional. He seemed a hell of a lot more emotional than I've seen Jennifer Soto. I can tell you that. And um, that upsets me that upsets me. Good morning, my beautifuls. So 
we're just going over a, a few cases. I'm glad you guys stayed with me this far. I know a lot of you guys are very eager to hear about the Sebastian Rogers case and any and all information related to his case. For those that are new to the Sebastian Rogers case, Sebastian Rogers is a 15-year-old autistic boy that disappeared from Hendersonville, Tennessee on February 26, according to his mother. Also, according to his mother, he went to bed the night before around 9 p.m., which was about three hours before her Katie Proudfoot, his mother, went to bed herself. She said when she woke up as usual around 6 a.m., he was gone. She did not indicate at first she ever left the house prior to calling law enforcement. However, a few interviews later, we hear that she is out looking, you know, in the streets, driving around, going to the school, having some movement when she told us very, very specifically there was none. That to me is very concerning. A lot of people are bouncing around whether this is a criminal investigation or not. And there's a few things I want to address with that. While law enforcement, at least in my opinion, I, I don't know if they have officially, I'm, I'm looking into that, el that element right now, whether they have officially caused, called this case a, a criminal investigation. There's a few reasons. I'll get to those in just a second. Bear with me. When this case started, which was February 26, uh, we are, yeah, February 26, we learned uh, from law enforcement that it truly, in fact, Chris Proudfoot did call into their main line, not 911, the main line, at around 6.33 in the morning. It's tagged and flagged, 6.33 in the morning. That is absolutely, without a doubt, confirmed. So we know for a fact, uh, according to law enforcement, that um, Christopher Proudfoot called their main line and started the missing person at 6.33 in the morning. We know that for a fact. So at 6.33 in the morning, law enforcement comes out. It's my belief that most, that the cavalry basically showed up by 7. I would think that through 30 minutes in, in a town like Henderson, they probably had every law enforcement, every available law enforcement in their surrounding area at their door within a half hour. Absolutely, hands down. We learned that there was uh, canines out there, the canine searcher, the, the the main guy, the main guy. I saw his face. He's in the command center showing Brian Enton the maps, you know, of the area and places that they, they've searched. And, and also um, Nick Barris. I think it was Nick Barris, not Brian Enton. Nick Barris. And so that's the, uh, that's the same guy that I saw interview that day on one of the news stations out there saying in his uh, in his massive amount of years he's never come up this empty handed on any case this is a man that has done this for a living for many decades and has never seen this i saw that same man in the nick barris interview inside the command center at those maps so i know that that was the guy that said it out of his mouth and he is law enforcement not just a searcher he works for that county. So that made me say, okay, so his information is legit. Um, so we've got that. What makes me believe that this is a criminal investigation, me personally, whether law enforcement comes out and tells us or not, is the fact that they upgraded this case literally within six hours. Now, his mom tried to say he walked out the door sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. in the morning. When law enforcement got there, they, they didn't immediately make this an endangered missing child. You got to remember, they didn't call this until 1217 that same day. It is my belief at 1217 on February 26 is when law enforcement knew something was not right with this boy. I think it was at that moment they knew this boy did not just walk out of the house. And the very next day, they even upgrade this further to an Amber Alert. To me, in order for you to have an Amber Alert, that implies criminality. And endangered person may not, but the Amber Alert, that tells me that I believe that this has been a dual investigation. I think the missing person, what we've been told, was the diversion. I really do. I think it's the distraction. I think they've been ran running this case as a criminal investigation since February 26 at 1217 in the morning. And if not at that moment, definitely by February 27th, when this was upgraded to an Amber Alert. That's just my personal opinion. 
So I had somebody tell, I told somebody, you know, if you can please call, uh, you know, please uh, send me the clip of if they said this is a criminal investigation. And the person did send me the clip. However, it doesn't say what case it's associated with. You know, I always worry about trolls and manipulation. I have to see the whole thing. I have to see the request was for Sebastian Rogers and the response that it's criminal investigation was actually attached to that request for information about Sebastian Rogers. So once I receive something like that, I'll let you know that it is corroborated that this is a criminal investigation. But I mean, how can it not be? It doesn't it doesn't feel like they're running this like a missing person case. It feels like they're running this as a, a criminal investigation. Um, and one of those uh, main one of the main indicators is the lack of communication. You have a lot of communication from law enforcement when you're at a missing person child um, alert because they're they're informing their community. You've got a lot more hands on. You know, the, the police are just wanting, uh, uh, um, you know, help from the public, help from the public, help from the public, you know, giving you the updates that you need because if he's spotted or whatever. So they're constantly keeping people updated uh, through media posts, through Twitter, through Facebook, um, you know, through uh, press conferences. When we have a missing person, we know the missing person's behavior. It's all hands on deck. Everybody, if anybody sees something, say something, you know, get his photo out far and wide, far and wide, far and wide. We've never really had that with this case since the beginning. Think about it. They've clammed up since the beginning. Does that sound like officers that are running a missing persons investigation? No, it doesn't. They don't. People don't start clamming up. They don't. They don't start holding the case to its chest until it goes to a criminal investigation. Once it goes to a criminal investigation, everybody's shut out. We talk about it all the time on here, all the time. So now you're shut out of uh, the case. How long? How how soon after this case started were we shut out? Almost immediately, like around twelve seventeen p.m. that same day. We haven't really had hardly any press conferences. We haven't had. Hardly any request for people to be involved, um, you know, search efforts. This, this is, this is, those are all the indicators that we see in missing persons that aren't here. So how can we say that this is just a missing persons investigation when none of um, the, the, the behaviors or the pro- uh, policies and procedures being followed is that, is that of the missing person policies and procedures? It's not. The policies and procedures being followed right now from law enforcement is criminal investigation procedures. So there is that as well. I don't need a law enforcement agent telling me that they're running a criminal investigation for me to know that they're running a criminal investigation. There are several key factors of a criminal investigation. And if people don't understand those, you know, educate yourself on them. Because in lack of information, me and my team, we look at the behaviors of law enforcement to help guide us in what's going on. And, and this, is, is, it, it, this is guiding me. And I'm sorry. I, I don't care whether law enforcement officially said that they're, they're a criminal. I'll tell you guys, they're in a criminal investigation. I think right now this is, this is moving into a, you know, potentially, well, I guess it wouldn't go into a homicide investigation until, you know, there are some additional indicators. I, I pray to God they haven't found those yet. But I have a funny feeling that they will. And, and if, if they're going to, I hope that they're found sooner than later, honestly. So... I think the stepdad did it. She's covering for him. What all has been found on him? There's nothing been found. And this is the problem I have. Because the lack of inf- the lack of evidence, in my opinion, truly is the evidence. This is a 15-year-old boy that allegedly walked out of his house with bare skin feet and no scent from a dog. Everybody tried to say it rained there. No, it didn't. I had somebody check the, the, there's a whole thing on the Find Sebastian. You guys can go there, go to the picture part. The lady has uh, all the, uh, the, the weather stuff for that day. There was no rain. There's no excuse for dogs not to pick up on the scent, period. He was barefoot. Barefoot. You know, barefoot. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So I truly believe this is a criminal investigation. I, I law enforcement, I think law enforcement may have. I'm clarifying because somebody did respond to me with the um, clip of the uh, response saying that they can't release this information due to the fact that this is a criminal investigation. But the, you know, it's, it's a little picture. I don't, you know, anybody can font and stuff like that. You can replicate stuff. We know social media will replicate stuff. So I want to make sure that what I'm looking at is truly, in fact, correct. So I need to see the email. I need to see the email to them, the request to them, and what they were requesting, and the response back. I need to make sure it's associated with him. 
But I do believe it's a criminal investigation. And I think the only reason they were keeping that under wraps is because they were wanting cooperative parents. Why are they wanting cooperative parents? Because they believe the parents have some type of culpability in this. You cannot tell me law enforcement agents aren't looking square at the parents at this moment. You can't tell me. Any idiot that comes here and says, Bullhorn Betty's wrong, I'm going to call you an idiot. I'm going to call you an idiot. (laughs) Sorry for being offensive, but I'm going to call you an idiot. Because this doesn't feel like a missing person case. This feels like a criminal investigation, if you, you ask me. If you don't know what goes into a criminal investigation or what behaviors law enforcement go through, Google it. Get yourself educated. Get yourself educated. Could someone, hold on, I'm seeing there's a bunch of stuff. Wow, we almost got 900 people in here. Someone could have taken him, and that's another reason it could be criminal. Somebody did take him. There's a scent, uh, Sabrina, there's a scent. They do believe that he was taken. They, there's a scent went over to where those lights, those, those, those lights ran to behind his house. There, there was a, a dog scent, the, the, the command guys. The dog scent went over there and disappeared. That's in, when you hear something like that, that indicates that he got into a vehicle. That right there indicates he, he was put into a vehicle. So we know that. But me personally, don't believe it's stranger danger. Who had the, the uh, opportunity or means to have access to this boy? This boy had no internet activity. This boy had no friends. So the only people he was in and around, he was very sheltered because of his condition. He was very, very sheltered. So the only people he was ever around was his family. So who would have had the ability to coax him out of his house? And not only that, if he was actually coaxed out of his house, he would have had shoes on. Because that, in an autistic boy, is a tick for him. He's not leaving. He doesn't even think about it. It's like whenever I try to read something, I have to grab glasses. Why do I have to grab glasses? Because I can't see. I'm not going to sit here and try to squint my eyes and read when my glasses are right there. He would have naturally, without thought, just naturally put his shoes on before he went outside, just out of behavior. He wouldn't have thought about it. It would. It's almost him putting his shoes on for him is like us breathing air for us. We do it organically. It, 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 we don't think about it. It just happens. So that's the first indicator that I don't believe he was coaxed out of the house. But we do know he was over in that other community and it appears that he left that other community by vehicle. That's what those, those things tell me. So yeah, I do believe somebody took him. I'm just saying it's a little closer to home. The mother not search. That's the biggest red flag. You are absolutely right. The mother not searching. The mother, the mother, the one that literally spit this child out, has that whole, carried this child for nine months, nurtured this child, watched this child take his first steps, taught taught this child to talk, you know, had the, the disappointment of finding out this child had problems and trying to raise this child the best she could. You know, maybe it's too much. I don't know. I don't know. I just know this boy should be here. And I know something happened inside that home. I just feel it. Because it's it's the it's the shoes that let me know that something happened inside this home because that to me in the way my brain thinks, that to me indicates that he was carried out and they just forgot his shoes. That's what it means to me. That's what it means to me. I'm sorry. It is. So I'm just waiting here with bated breath to find out what's going on. You know, Uvalde Foundation for Kids. I don't know why they're they're all of a sudden involving themselves in, into this case. I'm I'm you know at first I was hook line and sinker. I believe what they were saying, but you know I was expecting a more thorough and a more um, thought um, thoughtful follow up tweet. You know, explaining what the news is we got none of that we got more cryptic messages and by the second cryptic message i'm like this is not professional at all this is not coming from a professional organization i know professional organizations we deal with a lot of nonprofits all the time from you know especially here in my community i deal there there are we have goodwill here we have felt we have a lot of organizations you know salvation army whatnot And I don't ever, when I go on their tweets and Twitter pages, I don't see this kind of nonsense, you know, and I'm just, this doesn't seem professional to me. It doesn't, the the construction of the tweets don't seem professional to me. Um, 
they seem to be cryptic for a reason to spark people's curiosity and to keep them wanting to come back to get more information. And I don't like those those things. When we have information, we're not cryptic. We say we say what we think it is, right? We tell you it's not corroborated. You're going to have to do your own research, but we're not going to sit here and say, "Oh, guess what I guess what I know." Here, come over here. Guess what I know? Come over here. Sub up. Come on. I got something to tell you. It's, it's bomb shake, shaking information. We're going to reveal it soon. Don't forget to sub up, right? And then I go away, right? So you guys are all subbed up to my channel. I come back and I say, you're not going to believe this. I have personally stopped my search into this boy because we have some information that's going to be revealed from law enforcement really, really soon. And then crickets. It's like, who does that? Who does that? You, if, it, if this was me, it would be, guys, I got some major breaking news. Uh, you know, we had to shut down our search. There was some information that's coming out, you know, here in the near future. It is related to Sebastian, and it's not good news. But law enforcement has confirmed that they will be re releasing this at XYZ. Or it would be, listen, guys, this is the news I found. I, I talked to law enforcement. I don't know if they're going to take it seriously. It sounds like they're taking it seriously, but we have wrapped up our search for the day because we found X, Y, and Z. It's been very disturbing. We did hand over every bit of that information over to the law enforcement so they can do their thing. So hopefully here in the near future, in the next few days or uh, the upcoming weeks, you guys will learn a little addition, a little more information about this, um, this case related to Sebastian Rogers. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference in how to handle situations like this. What they did was 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 wrong. And if they really did expect law enforcement to come out, why didn't they just say we will be standing and supporting law enforcement when they come out with breaking information that we were able to help them uncover? Something like that. But the messages have been cryptic. I don't like that. That doesn't seem professional to me. It, the first one, okay, you know, that's you know, you're wanting everybody to know, oh my gosh, we just found information. You may put that out in, in, in the heat of the moment while you make sure that what you're about to release, you're going to be able to release. This is not the case. It was just, I don't know what the purpose of it was. I've never heard of them being outside of Texas. Definitely have never heard of them, you know, working the case of Sebastian Rogers all the way in Tennessee. I woke up one day and boom, Uvalde, a foundation for kids has been searching out there. And I'm like, wait a minute. I, I will, if they're on the grounds there, I would have heard about them. I know people don't think I got my ears on everything, but I literally have my ears on everything. When Equus Search was out there and nobody knew they were out there, I knew they were out there. So I know, I get, I, I'm told a lot of stuff from a lot of people that keep me attuned to all of this. And not only that, I've got a ma an amazing team behind me that is also doing the same stuff all day long. We get information. I never heard about this Uvalde Foundation for Kids being out there. I would have heard. Now, I'm not saying that I'm 100%, but the, the organizations that go out there and help, I'm, I'm aware of. I was aware of the United Cajun Navy, wasn't I? Sorry, if you guys see me, my lips are so dry. I, I've got some damage on my lips, and my lips do nothing but peel literally every day, all day for the last two years. Somebody has a remedy for it, please let me know. <laughs> so that's really it that I have on Sebastian. We don't have any new news. Um, nobody's obviously been arrested for any type of crime or anything like that. We do have a subscription goal, guys. If you guys haven't, you know, I've got a great team behind me. We're trying to build our subscribers here on TikTok because we put a lot of effort into making sure that you guys get up-to-date information every single morning about these cases. And I really do spend all day long searching this stuff. Now, here in the near future, I mean, right like tomorrow and the next day and the next day is going to be kind of hit and miss because I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to Tennessee to be looking for this very boy uh, myself out there in the woods. So we are going to have some traveling. I am going to come live with some of the searches and stuff like that for all of you guys to see. I do have some areas that I myself have honed in on that I I am dying to search. I really want to search these areas. I have a good feeling about them. It doesn't mean I'm going to find anything. But you never know unless you search. Everybody keeps saying, you know, like Olivia found that water bottle at Gabby Petito's and, and that was a hot mess because they were supposed to have collected it and failed to collect it. And so we ended up having to turn it into them. 
But everybody, you know, they were calling us liars and this, that, and the other there for the longest time. And it was like, you know, the FBI has the water bottle. We're not interjecting evidence into a federal investigation. Like, are you kidding me? They will throw you in jail for shit like that. People, you know, people need to use a little common sense. When you're saying people are planning evidence in a federal investigation, you better play, play that, that tape through. Because if anybody does that, the FBI don't play, okay? You're going to jail. You go and, and monkey F with a FBI investigation, dude. Are you freaking kidding me? Anybody, like, people should have knew that was a lie on its face just by that alone. But either way, however however it is, you know, it was found. Why was it found? Because we were looking. We didn't know what we were looking for. We were actually looking for Brian Laundry. We found a whole bunch of other stuff because we were looking for Brian Laundry, And that is kind of indicative of the people that are found in these searches, right? It seems like when you're looking for one person, 18 million different other people surface, right? It's because you're looking, you're looking. And so that's what we're going to be doing out there in the woods is we're going to be looking. I'm not looking for microscopic evidence that I need to do a grid search, okay? Everybody's talking, wants to, you know, toot their own horn by saying, well, this is how you do a search. Uh, no, let me break it. Let me, let me, I'm, I'm one of those kiss people. Keep it simple, stupid, okay? I don't know if you ever heard of that before, but I'm a, I'm a kiss person. I like to keep it simple. And um, so whenever you're looking at this, you, you need to, to realize we're looking for a, a five, five, 120 pound boy, okay? We're not looking for a little, a little tiny dot, okay? I'm not looking for something like that. I'm looking for something like that, okay? So you know what? My ground searches aren't going to be inch by inch by inch by inch. I'm looking for a very specific thing. If they want to look for evidence, that's that's their business. Look for your evidence. Look for your 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 whatever. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for him. I'm only looking for him. That's it. That's the only purpose of my going out there. So I don't do grid searches. Anybody knows grid searches, ground searches, and stuff like that. I usually clear probably about a five foot by five foot section when I'm out. Okay, um, so five foot by five foot, I move over five, 10 foot, five foot by five foot. So it's, I'm not, I'm not this inch by inch, you know, everybody touch your, your, you know, put your arms out and make sure we're all walking in a straight line type of stuff. We're looking for a big boy. I'm not out there looking for evidence. Once we find him, they can clear the area. They can get the, the evidence in and around him at that moment. Um, uh, the only purpose for me, now, if I see something there like glasses, you're always on the look for certain things that you know go to Sebastian Rogers. So it's not that if I do see something, I'm not going to call it in. Of course, I'm going to call it in. But that's I'm not looking for evidence. I'm looking for a boy. And that's what where my focus is going to be. So we'll get out there. We'll get in the woods. I will see you guys really soon. Uh, good morning, TGIF. Go rock it out with your coffee beans out. And we will see you all really, really, really soon. If you guys want to come over, I'll probably be doing a live on my YouTube channel, uh, kind of going in depth with this case. We've got two other cases we're going to be going in depth with on that um, live stream broadcast today at noon. And it'll also be uh, the Quentin Simon case. And there's another case that's kind of out in Flint, Michigan, that's actually affecting one of my mods. It's related to one of her friends. I hate the fact that one of my own mods family is going to be debuted on my channel. Um, but unfortunately, that's the case. So if you guys would love to, uh, I'm Bullhorn Betty. That's all you need to go. Anywhere you go, Bullhorn Betty. YouTube, Bullhorn Betty. Twitter, Bullhorn Betty. Instagram, Bullhorn Betty. Bullhorn Betty, Bullhorn Betty, Bullhorn Betty. <laughs> Gmail, Bullhorn Betty at gmail.com. You guys see a theme here? <laughs> Just saying, I'm Bullhorn Betty. If you haven't noticed, who, who, who's your favorite funny girl? It's me. It's me, Bullhorn Betty. What's the case in Flint? Um, well, it's about a, a man named Dan. And um, it's one of my mod's cousins. And there was a fire, a pew-pew fight with Ellie. And um, he lost his life. But when you look at the case, that pew-pew fight with Ellie, he was unarmed. So... We got some. We got some some issues, and uh, my mod jumped right into action at the very beginning and collected a massive amount of evidence up front um, for her family, 
for them to be able to use. They were able to get a, a well-known uh, attorney in the area to take their case. And um, this is this is pretty big. So she'll be talking about it on my channel. Again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll dovetail into all those um, cases and updates and information over on YouTube. So if you guys want to hit me up over on YouTube, I'm at Bullhorn Betty or... I also have a smaller channel called Bullhorn Betty Crime Stories. Um, so it depends on, you know, do you like a large group or do you like a smaller group? So if you like a larger group, go to Bullhorn Betty. If you like the smaller group, go to Bullhorn Betty Crime Stories. Um, and uh, that's where we'll be. And we'll be there about noon to learn a little bit more about these cases. I want to thank each and every one of you here on TikTok for all your beautiful love and support, especially this ridiculous time in the morning, right? Nobody's up this time of morning. Well, Bullhorn Betty is, and so are you. All right, guys, go rock it out with your coffee beans out and make it a great day. I love you all, and God bless.